Hello, and welcome to Follow Your Curiosity, where we explore the ups and downs of the creative process and how to keep it moving. I'm your host, Nancy Norbeck. I am a writer, singer, improv comedy newbie, science fiction geek, and creativity coach who loves helping right-brained folks get unstuck. I am so excited to be coming to you with interviews and coaching calls to show you the depth and breadth both of creative pursuits and creative people, to give you some insight into their experiences, and to inspire you. I've mentioned before on the show that my original idea for this podcast included traveling to different places to find and talk to all sorts of creative people. I still hope to make that piece happen one day. Allison Happily Homeless Miller, my guest today, is actually doing it. Allison lives on the road in her pink teardrop trailer, and her mission is to find and spread love wherever she goes as a memorial to her late husband, Chuck. Her journey has taken her back and forth across the U.S. multiple times, introduced her to things she'd never encountered before, like opera, and has taught her to live in the present and stop thinking about the future. While her journey started as and continues to be an expression of grief, her story is remarkably uplifting and encouraging, and she's now in the process of turning it into a documentary to share with the rest of the world. Her creative and literal journey is unlike any other, and it's one of the most inspiring I've ever heard. Here's my conversation with Allison Miller. Allison Miller, I am like so psyched to talk to you because I'm absolutely fascinated by what you're doing. I'm really glad you're here. Well, thank you. Thank you. Wow. Fascinated. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great word. So so you are literally on an unusual journey, and I'm hoping you can start off by telling us what you're doing and how you how you got the idea. All right. Uh, let's see. Well, first things first, I got the idea because my husband Chuck and I had, we sold everything, uh, our house and all of our belongings in 2009 in New Jersey. He retired from, he had been previously um, active duty and then he retired civil service um, from McGuire Air Force Base in Jersey. And I left my job and we decided to go out on the road together, uh, just to adventure and get out of the rat race. And so we had our last four years together doing that. And uh, he had one bout of cancer in those four years, uh, about after the first year and a half, and he recovered from the, from that cancer via six surgeries and major wow. radiation and everything else. And we continued traveling as soon as he would um, recuperate a little bit, we'd head right back out on the mm-hmm. road again. So we did that for our last four years together. And then in 2013, it was right about this time, actually, uh, we headed to Southern California. Uh, we had had a rental there for um, three months, and he was getting sick, and uh, we didn't think it was, we didn't, I don't know why I didn't think it was the cancer returning, but he didn't either, and uh, I took him to the ER at the end of March, and he was, uh, cancer was everywhere, Oof. and so after five days hospital stay, uh, I found a hospice for him, and mm-hmm. um, and then he died three weeks later. Wow. And that is what, I mean, the, 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 the kind of the real clear part of the story is that that's when I started my odyssey of love, uh, because I, after he died, I didn't have a house to return to. We'd been mm-hmm. on the road for these years, and uh, and so I decided to stay on the road. And I bought a little trailer, and I bought a new car, and I painted them pink, <laughs> a color that was customized for me, mm-hmm. and and I set out on what became my odyssey of love. So how long have you been on this journey on your own now? It's been uh, over six and a half years. Uh, I, st- I stopped counting at six and a half years because my heart just can't bear it any longer to count how Fair long enough. he's been. So I stop. So the way I look at it from here on out, even if it's been, if I survive another 20 years and somebody says, oh, how long has your husband been dead or how long have you been on the road? I'll, I'm going to say six and a half years. <laughs> Um, even if it's 20 years, because time ceases to have any meaning. And I've realized more and more in the time since Chuck has been gone, that our measurement of time is purely a social construct, and it has Mm -hmm. nothing to do with each of us individually. 
And so for me, he has been dead forever. And sometimes I'm not even sure if he ever really existed. And yet uh, the fallout and the, uh, the emotional aspects of his, of his being dead, um, it's like it was yesterday. Sure. So yeah. I've been on the road technically. I've crisscrossed the country eight times. Wow. And, and, and so it's been over six and a half years. Wow. You know, it's funny when you, when you say that. I, I've noticed in a completely different context, you know, I, I have two nephews who are seven and four. And I look at the seven-year-old and I go, no, it's been five minutes since you were born. Yes. You, you know, right? I mean, really, it's, you know, if, if you didn't have to acknowledge the fact that you can no longer just hold him in your arms, mm-hmm. it, you know, you would swear that it was, you know, yes. five minutes. And, and yet he's also and- been here forever. Yes. You know, I can't really remember what life was like before him all that well anymore. And same with his little brother. So, yeah. Exactly. exactly. Time is, the measurement of time is just, it's a very strange thing. It's really, we've got our social construct of how life works and when you go to your job and finish your job and all this other stuff. But then we've got our own personal constructs of time, which is really very, very individual and subjective. Yeah. Yeah, and our and our perceptions of what's real too, like you were saying, yeah. sort of like, yeah. you know, did I did I really go on that vacation or did I just dream that vacation? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And maybe exactly. it doesn't matter whether it was real or whether we dreamed it, as long as we remember it. I don't. I don't know. I kind of agree with. I I go along with that thinking now because the way that I look at life. Um, since Chuck died and with my own particular definition of time is that I am fully, I I live in the past and I'll freely admit it. My life was better with Chuck. Um, So I live in the past. At the same time, I fully live here in the present Mm -hmm. in my odyssey of love. And that is the one thing that really sparks any, um, any any passion in me about still being alive, um, and I don't think about the future because we, you know, I mean, we all have this thing, you know. Well, you know, uh, how how life can change on a dime. Like there's all of these mm-hmm. different uh, quotes about life and how quickly it can end. Well, I've seen that numerous times in my life, and with the most powerful one being Chuck's death, where once again. It was three weeks, and that can seem like a long time to somebody who had nothing. And it seems like no time at all, but that three weeks was like three million centuries for mm-hmm. all that was in those three weeks. So I don't think of the future, um, well, first of all, because it's a future without him, and I don't like to envision that. And second of all, I have no idea if it will happen. So um, I, I live in the past, and I think about my life with Chuck. And I live in the present doing my odyssey of love. And it kind of just begins and ends there. And I've, I've really kind of simplified it. Yeah, all, of my, all of my thinking about it is, what, is what's happened. How did that work for you? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, say 10, 20 years ago, you probably thought about the future a lot more. Was it a big adjustment? Or did you just realize one day, I'm not doing this. I'm just done thinking about the future. It wasn't a big adjustment at all, honestly, Um, because the the idea of living however many years, and I'm I'm 61 now, and uh, I was 55 when Chuck died, the idea of living a future and growing old without him was so unbearable and unfathomable to me. So um, I thought, well, and I didn't have the, the energy physically or emotionally or mentally in the years after he died to be thinking way into the future. Mm -hmm. And so I just became very solid about being right in the present. And as Chuck used to say, just look down to look down to where your feet are and just be there. And so that's what I do. I've become this, this model person for living in the present. And uh, now with my odyssey of love and the different things that I'm doing, I, for the first time, I'm a little bit looking 
into the future, but not with any real sense of the future. It's like, okay, well, I'd like it to take this direction or that direction, but I don't have any emotional investment in that either. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it might happen, but it also might not happen, you know? And so I just, once again, I look down to where my feet are and I, I just say, okay, well, this is the direction you're going to go now and maybe in the next couple days. Here's the tasks that you need to do. And what that all of this has helped me to do is, uh, is not only to live in the present, but to trust my heart to lead me to where I need to be or want to be. Wow. And I just said it that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm wondering, like, you know, in the process of learning to live in the present, you must have learned a whole lot about yourself because it's so it's so ingrained in us to think about the future all the time. Did I mean, did you find that things became easier? Was it, you know, did, did it just clear a mental space? I don't know how much you may or may not have noticed about that, but... Well, that's... Hmm, that's a good question. Honestly, none of it has really been a struggle primarily, and it's not because I'm 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 so, you know, Zen Buddhist and all of this mm -hmm. other stuff. It's more because um all that I all that I knew to trust at, at when Chuck died, my entire world disintegrated around me. You know, we had been living on the road, so we were temporarily here in Southern California. I knew that our rental was up three weeks after he died. So I would have to leave. And so I'd have to go do something. Mm -hmm. And I, so like everything was shattered and disintegrated around me. And all that I knew any longer after he died was that he loved me more than I have ever been loved in my life. And I loved him more than I've ever loved anybody in my life. I trusted that love. And so I just thought, okay, I'm just going to hang on to that. I know that to be true. I don't know anything else to be true. And everything else is speculation about the future, with the future being, you know, even five minutes from now. Mm -hmm. I can trust that he loved me and that he left so much love behind for me. Bam. And that, like, I didn't even think anymore beyond it. So I didn't even consciously clear anything. I just... I didn't have anything else but his love mm -hmm. at that moment. And so that's what I, um, that's what I, that's what I trusted. And then I just kept trusting it and, and it's led me to this point to where I am now. And I, I don't overthink anything. I hardly ever think, which is not necessarily good for <laughs> when it comes to paying bills and paying attention to the, the little things in daily life. Um, I would much rather, you know, people talk about being in their heart space. That's where I am. And I'm, I'm just not really good with uh, all of the stuff where I have to think things out and details about living life. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it's, it's almost, um, it, it's become, it's, it's like this survivalist thing. And and sometimes I feel when I've been out on the road for a long while and then I take a break, I think, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of surprised that I'm able to be in polite society anymore <laughs> because, because, you know, I, I've all of the stuff that people do when I, when I'm out on the road, I live so differently and I'm fully just involved in where my heart is. And, uh, but other things are required in life when you show up in social situ situations. So, I just, I just keep trusting my heart. I thought my heart will be my compass. I'm just going to let love lead the way. That's all that I know to be true anymore. And it has stood me in good stead. And I don't know how or why. And I never, I, I did not used to be so trusting of just my heart. I used my head also. Mm -hmm. um, but all of that, I didn't know anything after Chuck died. I didn't remember what I had known. But I knew he loved me and he I knew that he left that love behind for me. So I've just I've let that be my guide, my compass. That's amazing. It's obviously done you really, really well for years now. Holy shit. I mean, <laughs> seriously, the stuff that has happened, you know, just the daily stuff. Um, I, I just I don't know. People show, seem to show up in my life. 
when I need them as a result. And it has, for the last couple of years, it's, it's very much become my mantra when things go wrong. Like if my trailer breaks down or my car breaks down and, you know, there's mu- huge amounts of money that are needed to repair either one of those or I need a place to stay, whatever it might be. I just, rather than the panic that would be very, uh, my usual response, I just, I just start saying to myself over and over, um, look for the love, look for the love, look for the love. And it happens. And I, I don't even actually try explaining it anymore. Um, I just know that I am on, that I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing with this odyssey of love. And I just need to keep on doing it. And I need to keep on trusting that um, love will find me and I'll find love. It's amazing. And and yet, you know, even though you're not really explaining it, because how could you possibly? It just makes sense to me. So I'm hoping people who are listening will <laughs> feel the same way and not be sitting there right now thinking, what? <laughs> I know, right? Because... I mean, I've always, like, Chuck and I had a very strong and passionate love relationship and romantic relationship for all of our 24 years. So I've always been, like, a romantic at heart, and and, all, and, I, and it was fully um, exercised in, in my relationship with him. I was also um, very kind of pragmatic, and I'm at the same time now as, yes, it's okay, love leads away. I'm also very pragmatic about stuff. But I'm kind of pragmatic about love. Like, it's not just this, this oh, tiptoe through the tulips <laughs> and blah, 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 and all the unicorns and all this other absurd stuff. I'm talking about the real thing mm-hmm. and where it has brought me. And, you know, people will, um, every so often as I've traveled over the years, they'll look at the pink on my car and my, my trailer and the color was customized for me. The man that I found after Chuck died, um, and I, I had bought a new car, and I told him, I need you to create a shade of pink for me. I'm going out on the road. I told him about my and Chuck's love story, and I said, create a color for me. And he created it for me, and I had him paint my car that color. And then when I bought my trailer, I did, and I had all bright yellow trim, and I said, paint everything that's yellow, paint it pink. And I set out on the road, and I, I've had people sometimes along the way say, "Oh, that's so pretty! It's like Barbie pink," or it's like, <laughs> and it's like you know what? You are so off the mark with that. This is a strong, powerful shade mm-hmm. of pink. The color is named. The guy named it for me, and it's named Chuck's watching over me pink. And he said that's to give you courage to return to the road on your own. That's so, awesome. It's not some weak Barbie pink. And the same way that I'm talking about real love, I'm not talking about, I don't, star-crossed lovers and, I don't know, all the bubblegum, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm talking about a solid, loving, strong, passionate relationship for 24 years where we are just as much in love the night he died as we were 24 years earlier when we met. And that kind of love that has carried me all of these years around this country when I had never camped and I'd never towed and I was terrified and riddled with anxiety and I had no clue how to do this without Chuck. And I didn't even know if I wanted to do it without Chuck. I just knew that I had to do it without Chuck. Right. And I knew that he loved me. And so it all of this pink, this is my armor. My car is my chariot. And... And I'm pulling this beautiful traveling tribute to love. There are names written all over it of people from around the world. Their people send me their names and they say, can you write my person's name, my daughter, my son, my parent, my husband, my wife, whoever it might be. Can you write their name on your rig so that they can travel with you? Because that will help me feel like they're still alive somehow. And it's covered with names front, back and sides. It's love. It is a real thing. That is so fantastic. It is. I mean, I know I don't need to tell you that, but that is so fantastic. I know, right? <laughs> it is powerful. Yeah. So I say to people when they say, oh, that's, you know, pretty Barbie, pink, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, do you see all those names written on there? 
That's not Barbie doll shit. That is love. So it's not only the love that Chuck left behind for me, it's the love of people from all around the world and all around the country that I've met. And that as I meet them in person, they write messages of love on it because I keep the pens handy there. And so it's the, the love stories that are carried within their names, all of that. This is not just some pretty little love story. Yeah. thing. This is about a love story that I had. And then a love story that I created for myself out on the road with all these people who come along with my odyssey of love. So when when the first person wrote someone's name on there, was it their idea or was it your idea? How did that happen? I remember the exact first signature. It was when my daughter, uh, I was traveling back out to Arkansas because I was going to be uh, work camping at an opera camp. And my my trailer broke down in Winslow, Arizona. You know, standing in front of all that. And yes. we did all of that stuff while we were broken down. But I remember, um, and that was the first time that I did this. I had seen something. I had heard a big pop, and I saw some smoke coming out of the back of my trailer. And fortunately, we were not on the highway. And so I pulled to a stop, and it was the first time that as my hand hit the, um, the handle, the door handle to open the door, I started saying to myself, okay, look for the love. Look for the love. And I ended up finding out, uh, finding um, a mechanic. Uh, he and his family ran a garage there in town, and he came to help me. We were broken down for three days, and he was the first one to sign my trailer. Um, his name's Tiger. And mm-hmm. he and his family, they set me up, me and my daughter, up at their garage, and they put a big mat outside so that we wouldn't dra- um, drag oil inside. And he set me up with electricity and uh, and we would just talk with them all throughout the day um, as we were there. And as he was leaving, I had already made the decision to start adding names to my okay. trailer. And uh, I wasn't sure how I was going to go about doing it. But um, I asked Tiger if he would sign my trailer. And so he put him his name and all of his family name on with um, and wrote Happy Trails. And since that time, I always just keep the pens handy now. So if I'm stopped at a rest stop along the way or uh, anywhere where I might be, uh, I just, and people come up to talk to me like, why all that pink? And I say, would you like to sign my trailer? Do you have a name that you would like to add to it? And I'll, I'll carry them with me. And I have all these names now. And then people who follow my Odyssey of Love on my Happily Homeless Facebook page uh, they send me the names. They, I get messages all the time. Uh, people from from New Zealand and Australia and the UK uh, sending me the names of their loved ones and saying, could you write my daughter's name, my son's? Uh, they always wanted to come to America and travel. And now I feel like they'll be traveling with you. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. It is. It's a beautiful thing. So I'm curious because you said you'd never done anything like this before. You'd never camped, you'd never towed, you never did any of that. What? How did you end up being drawn to the idea of doing that? I knew when Chuck died, he and I, as we traveled, we had stayed uh, on military bases a lot of times at, at their lo- you know base lodging. Uh, we'd stayed at inexpensive hotels. And uh, I knew that I had to change up how I did that because... I, it just would be emotionally unbearable for me to mm. continue in the way that he and I had been doing it. Also, I thought there would be nothing more pathetic than me as a, a, a widow weeping into my, you know, delicately trimmed, lace trimmed handkerchief in, this, <laughs> you know, in some hotel in the back of beyond, um, you know, wailing and moaning because my husband was dead. I didn't like that picture. Mm-hmm. And, so I didn't exactly, when I first left Southern California that day, I didn't know exactly how I was going to change that up. Um, I went back to uh, New Jersey so that I could <clears throat> give Chuck full military honors and uh, at a memorial service. And my daughter had been looking around and she told me, she sent me a link that she had found for a little trailer called a Tab Teardrop. 
and I it was up there's a place up in New England that sold them and I went to visit my son up there and so he and I went over to take a look and I bought it on the spot I didn't even know I didn't even know I was that I had to buy a hitch to go with it <laughs> <laughs> that's how naive I was about it uh, fortunately the guy said oh you'll need a hitch and I he said is your car uh, is the engine strong enough to tow it and I said well I don't know <laughs> it was a cylinder Ford Escape, and uh, so they looked at the engine. and They said, "You're just this much okay. You can you can just barely tow it." Oh man! So I said, "Okay, paint. Here's here's the can of paint because the can of paint had the formula on it for mm-hmm. the mix. So he mixed it up and he painted everything. And then they gave me two days of camping across the street at a KOA, and um, t- the guy took me out on the road to theoretically show me how to tow a, a trailer." I was terrified. I was terrified. Like, what if I jackknife? What, what about backing up? I don't know how to back up. How do you even learn how to back up? And every time somebody told me a different way, like you place your hands at 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock and then you do the blah, blah. And it was like a math problem in my head. And I started <laughs> sweating and get anxiety. And it's like, oh, my God, I don't know what I'm doing. And now I can back up perfectly. Mm-hmm. Unless somebody is watching me, in which case it's, you know, just it's going to take quite a while. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you just knew as soon as you saw it. Yes. Yeah. I, it was, it's cute. It's kind of retro. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had, I knew about a group called Sisters on the Fly and they're women who have vintage trailers who go, uh, they, a lot of them rehab their trailers. And I knew that I didn't have the time, money or expertise for rehabbing one on my own. So my, my teardrop is, uh, it's vintagey looking, but it was new, and it was small enough for me to handle. I guess I don't know. <laughs> it was big enough for me to fit into. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't looking for a lot of space. Um, and so, I don't know. I bought it because it was cute. That's all I could. And 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 I said, here, paint it this color and and hitch it up, and I'll figure it out. Cute is as good a reason as any. Honestly, as long as it works, right? I know. Yes. Yeah. And the way I looked at it with any of this starting out, I had already, like when I was leaving Southern California three weeks after Chuck died and his, uh, his urn was on the, you know, riding shotgun and the, the level of anxiety that was in me and, um, how do I do this? And I felt like I was abandoning him because I was leaving the last place that he had been alive and that we had been together. And uh, I could barely see for, for just all the tears. And then I thought, you know, as I, as you know, then I start, then I bought the, tr- the car and then the trailer and everything started kind of revealing itself to me that about this odyssey of love, I thought, really, what else is there to be frightened of? I watched Chuck died in front of me mm-hmm. and um, and after he died my my daughters and I uh, bathed him and dressed him and anointed him and I helped lift his body onto the gurney and zip up the body bag and then I went to the uh, crematorium uh, a week later and I pressed the switch to admit his body into the crematorium after doing that, there's really not much to be afraid of. Yeah, it's true. It's yeah. true. So I just I, did. Yeah, I feel like, you know, we we forget that we've all done things that, mm-hmm. you know. That's right. It, I, I mean, for me, I flew to Northern Ireland when I was 23 or just barely 24 to live with mm-hmm. a family I had never met for six months. Wow. Wow. And I had talked to, I guess it was just the father on the phone once. And that was it. Because I just really, really, really wanted to go live in another country for a while. And I had not been able to when I was in college, like most people do. And right. I was like, this is it. This is my chance. I am not tied down by anything. I'm going now, you know? And you know, it's funny because I was so excited and I was getting things ready and all of that. And it was not until I was sitting on the plane on the tarmac yeah. that I thought, oh, dear God, what on earth am I doing? 
Mm-hmm. It, you know, it, and I, I, I felt like I was flying into a black hole. Yeah. Because here I was, you know, family with five kids. What do I know about taking care of five kids? What do I know about living in another country? I mean, at least I didn't have to deal with a language barrier much. It was right. Ireland. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> some of my favorite words in the English language I learned while I was there. But, um, but yeah, I was just like, oh, dear God, what am I doing? I'm flying across an ocean by myself to live with people I've never met in a country I've never even been to. Mm-hmm. Am, have I lost my mind? You know, and it was right. that moment when I thought all of these people who've kind of looked at me like, you sure you want to do this? Really? Mm-hmm. This is the thing you're going to do? All of a sudden, they seemed to be making a whole lot of sense as I sat on that plane. <laughs> I mean, I was not getting off of that plane for love or money. Right. But but it, it was. It was just this moment of, I don't know what I'm doing. And then I almost got sick on the plane. So I didn't sleep on the plane. Then I had to get through immigration. And let me tell you, boy, do they look at you funny when you say you're coming in for three months. And, you know, you're on a leave of absence from your job. And I'm staying with friends. Uh Um, Yeah. And somehow I got through that because I'm just standing there going, don't put me back on another plane. I barely (laughs) survived the first one. (laughs) But, But that is the thing. When I really get, you know worried about something, I'm terrified I can't do anything, whatever, you know, a lot of the time, not always, but a lot of the time, there is this little part of me that will pipe up and say, lady, you flew into a black hole 24 years ago. Exactly. If you can do that, you can do this. Remind yourself of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all do. We have done hard things. Yeah. And my favorite quote, uh, one of my favorite quotes is uh, Eleanor Roosevelt saying every... Each day we must do that one thing we fear the most. Mm -hmm. And for me, that one thing I fear the most since the night Chuck died is living another day without him. And so I also remember what Chuck always used to say um, to his sponsees. Um, He was uh, in AA and he was a sponsor. And he would say, um, you have to suit up and show up. Mm. And that's what I do. I suit up and I show up in as much pink as possible because Chuck <laughs> told me before he died, he said, don't wear black. He said, don't mourn mm. for me in black, wear pink. And I know now um, that it's because he wanted me to have some color in my life. Mm-hmm. And he knew I loved the color pink. And I, so everything around me is as, I wear as much pink as possible and I have as much pink around me as possible. It reminds me to not only to keep suiting up and showing up, but to to keep my heart open to the possibilities of love. And I don't mean romantic love. I just mean to to love that is out there in the world because we get so jaded, especially as the world gets more and more confusing and kind of ugly. And I think we all get jaded and we forget that love really is everywhere. And... It does show up. And if you show up with enough love, it's not that it will conquer everything. Ugly things can still happen. But I always just try to show up with as much love as possible for my own protection. And then give it to as many people as possible so that they can have even a few minutes experience of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not in charge of what happens out there in the world. I just know that I can do my part of suiting up and showing up with love. And um, the pink reminds me of that and of what Chuck said to me and what I said to him that I'm going to paint my car pink so you can find me out on the road. And he said, I'll be looking for you. And um, and so I just keep doing that. This is all such an amazing story. So, so I'm curious to know how, since you have traveled back and forth so many times, how do you decide which way to go? How did, I mean, you mentioned an opera, I can't remember uh, what camp, you said, a camp. camp. How, you know, how did, how did you find an opera camp in the first place and what made you decide to go and, and, you know, anywhere else that you've gone? How do you, how do you pick where you, where you land? Well, um, once again, I let my heart lead me. Oftentimes I'll know that I'm heading north, south, east, or west. Um, I always allow plenty of time to get there, wherever there might be, um, because I might be led to take a left turn instead of a right turn Mm -hmm. or something like 
that uh, or I might meet somebody and they'll say, well, come visit me. And I'll say, okay. Uh, I ended up at the opera camp. It's called Opera in the Ozarks um, outside Eureka Springs in Arkansas because I needed to earn some money. I wanted to be able to stay on the road. And so I found out about a thing called work camping, and which a lot of people do who live on the road full time. And, uh, and so I, I found a, there's a Facebook group for work campers and I joined it having no clue what I was doing or what I'm even looking mm-hmm. for. And so I just put up a post with a picture of my rig, which always draws the eye. And I said that I was looking for a work camping gig in Arkansas. Could anyone help me out? I don't know. And so somebody sent me a link to all these, um, it, uh, all the states in it. And I clicked on Arkansas and I went looking and I found this, um, this gig in uh, at the opera camp. And they had two positions open. One was for a secretary and one was for a groundskeeper. And the old safe me would have said, oh, well, you were a secretary before, so go for that. And I thought, yeah, but that's not my life anymore. So I'm going to put in for the groundskeeper. And I mean, I'd, I'd kept a lot of gardens when we had a home in New Jersey. So, I mean, I knew some basic stuff, but honestly, I gardened with a lot more enthusiasm than knowledge. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so, I, but I applied for the job as groundskeeper and they did a background check and the director emailed me and she said, um, do you, are you strong enough to wield a weed whacker? And I thought, well, I don't know. I was like, you know, six years ago, five years ago. So I'm assuming, you know, I, I mean, mm-hmm. I'll figure it out. And so they hired me. And, uh, and I, this is the first year I'm not returning to the opera camp. Uh, I've, I've spent three summers there work camping, living in my trailer and being a groundskeeper and shoveling dirt and making gardens and doing all kinds of stuff and being exposed to opera for the first time because they produce and perform three different operas every year and students and staff and orchestra comes from all around the country and all around the world. And, uh. So it's been a it's been a wonderful experience, and uh, so other than that, um, I really the way that I uh, figure out where I'm going, it's going to start changing now. But up until this point, the way that it's uh, the way that I've figured it is just um, letting my heart lead me again. You know, okay, I I know I want to end up on the East Coast, but who knows what's going to happen between here and there? You know, mm-hmm. vice versa. And originally, what uh, the, the way that I was directed was that I had told Chuck before he died that um, I would return to our favorite places and scatter his cremains. Ah. And so I, I did that. Um, and what I realized, like a, a lot of this odyssey, this odyssey of love has really, it's this big puzzle piece. And... I've only put the pieces together in retrospect. You know, I've remembered conversations that Chuck and I had before he died and things that I told him and he told me. And it's like, oh, there's another puzzle piece and there's another one. And so it's starting to fit this picture. Um, and so I told him I, I'm going to return to those four places. And I knew, and I know still, that there were other places that Chuck wanted me to scatter his cremains but he could only start me out on this odyssey of love. Mm-hmm. He could not finish it for me or continue it for me. And I know that in his heart, he hoped that by, if I kept my heart open, which I would have to do in order to recognize those other places, that that would help me create a life for myself without him. And so um, after those four places, I've, uh, I've recognized other places because I just, I just let my heart lead me, and um, I'm not even sure how to define that mm-hmm. or tell you exactly what that means. Um, the only um, true emotion that I ever truly that I really feel anymore is just is just love in its strongest strongest sense, um, and so I show up with that as much as I can and I keep that going and I figure as long as I'm doing that um, I will continue creating a life because this life that I have now over six and a half years later is something I never ever would have imagined for myself sure 
um, and and not in a not in a good way or a bad way. Just I never could have imagined. And being out on the road by myself, like like I'm not a camper. I am I'm so not a camper. Um, I just happen to live in a trailer and I happen to camp, but I don't consider myself <laughs> a camper. <laughs> Like I, I, I don't carry any camping equipment with me or hiking. I carry a lot of craft stuff because that's how I, I work with my grief. Um, I love upcycling clothes and making crazy hats, and that kind, that's the stuff I carry with me. Um, my trailer is not practical inside, but oh, is it beautiful? It looks like the inside of Jeannie's bottle from I Dream of Jeannie. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I don't have practical things hanging on the wall to put things in. Um, it's, it's, it's beautiful shades of raspberry pink and pops of gold and, 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 and uh, copper and uh, with hangings over the bed and totally impractical, and I love it. You, so, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for totally impractical. I agree. You know, they're it, really... It, it, it's what suits me. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, as, as much as I you know, hear you saying that how you do this is to a large extent inexplicable. I am kind of struck by the fact that the way you have picked where you go feels similar to me to the way I write a book. Because when, so in the writing community, you'll often hear people talk about how there are plotters and there are pantsers. Yes. Not to be confused with panthers, which is what autocorrect always wants to do with that word. Um, I'm definitely not a panther. <laughs> but plotters are the people who figure out the whole thing, have the whole big outline, and probably, oh, you know, oh. the little string diagram on the wall, like you see in the movies for, like, oh. police procedurals. Um, and, and they know every detail of what's going to happen in this book before they write it. Mm -hmm. If you made me write a book that way, I could never write a book. Because right. I would already know what the story is. Mm -hmm. I write to figure out what the story is. I write because some yeah. little spark of an idea has popped into my head. And I just want to know what happens. And I mm -hmm. just, I can't get it out of my head until either I write it or I ignore it long enough that it says, forget you, I'll go find somebody else to write this story. And so, and, and there are people who plot, who cannot even believe that people can not have any idea where they're going and write a decent book, no. which just says to me that these are two radically different mindsets. But, you know, I may know that at some point the character has to get to this place mm -hmm. and that it's probably, you know, a hundred pages from now or, right. you know, maybe more, maybe less, but something like that. But other than that, I'm just, you know, it's just kind of happening in my head onto the page mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily know where it's going to go. I don't know which characters are going to turn up. I don't know which, you know, my character <laughs> may true. decide that she's going to turn left and I'm saying, no, you need to turn right. And, you know, it sounds crazy to people who haven't written. But, you know, I've had arguments with characters where uh -huh. I'm saying, no, no, I, I need you to go this way. And the character says, no, no, sorry, I have to go this way. And you go, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm the author. You're the character. You need to go this way. And they just look at me and go, no, you don't understand. I'm my, I'm myself. And I know I have to go this way. And this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And the first time yeah. that happens to you, you really do think you've completely lost your mind. But, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. And, and this was actually the really terrifying thing about grad school for me, because, you know, you have four semesters, to write this mm -hmm. book and polish it up and, and get it ready to be considered publishable so you're allowed to have your diploma. Right. And you can add extra semesters, but who wants to do that? And, I mean, if you really need it, you want to do it. But otherwise, four semesters is plenty. <laughs> but when I, when I started, I decided I was going to write all short stories because I thought they're short, they're compact, I can't get lost in them, and I can experiment with them, forgetting mm -hmm. that I've never done anything short in my entire life. So, you know halfway through the semester I have this story I don't know what it is I send it in my advisor says this is not a short anything I go oh yeah right because this is me and I had to decide am I going to switch gears and do this novel or am I going to try to stick with the short story thing and the big thing that terrified me about deciding to do the novel was I don't know if I can finish it I've never finished a novel who who knows oh, Yeah. and I did and it's out there in the world but you know, still, it's just kind of like, I don't know, because I don't have a plot. I don't know how to 
I, 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 yes. I don't know how long this is. I don't know how long it's going to take, you know? And, yes. and so in a way it seems to me that, that there's a certain degree of similarity there because I had no idea where I was going and, you know, mm-hmm. you are just following whatever strikes you in the right way. Yeah. So, yeah. And it works somehow. It, it does. Works. Let, when I was in Arkansas last year at the opera camp, uh, Chuck died on April 21st of 2013. And so April 21st um, since then has always been my new year, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And that's when I kind of assess things and reevaluate or do whatever I need to do. And last April 21st, I said to myself, you know what? It's time to make a documentary about your odyssey of love. And I, like, I've never made a documentary. I don't know people who make documentaries. I don't have money to make a documentary. All of that stuff. I just knew I had to, it was time to make a documentary. And when I got back here to Arizona, I ended up meeting a woman who was a photographer who has, who was starting, it's a fledgling company with a, a friend of hers who is incredible with a camera and they're both very creative and we're now making a documentary about my odyssey of love i call it a love entry and uh, <laughs> we've done a lot of filming already and it's going to be going into editing probably in a couple of months and when it's done i also don't know how to um i want to have a uh, a premiere mm-hmm. in it's i don't know how to do that don't have the money for it none of it but i'm going to have a premiere with a pink carpet for all the guests to walk, and I'm going to show my love entry, and then I'm going to take it out on the road, and I'm going to show it at big and small venues all around the country, and um, and I'm going to submit it to some film festivals. I don't know how I'm going to do any of that. I just know I'm going to do it because I'm going to just keep trusting love to show up. That's fantastic. Can can you tell us about the process of doing it so far? What that's been like? It's, you know, it's kind of been extraordinary uh, seeing, and I've only seen a little bit of, of what we filmed, but uh, first of all, I feel very natural with it. I've, I've realized this uh, streak in me since Chuck died that, um, I, I mean, I've always been uh, uh, an extrovert and, uh, you know, I've always loved dress up and costume and all of that, but boy, have I realized that part of me. And so... Uh, doing the filming, I feel very natural in front of a camera, and I speak very easily. And um, and so, listen, listening to people talk about the impact my Odyssey of Love has had on them. I've we've uh, we have some submissions from people that we want to have their voices mm-hmm. as voices has brought me to tears because for me. I'm just out here doing this because this is the only thing that makes me feel alive. And, uh, and I told Chuck before he died that, um, before I die, you know, I'm going to make sure that everybody knows your name and that you lived and that you're a good man and you brought so much love to this world. And so making this documentary and then showing it, it's, it's my, my love letter to him and it's my love letter to all of the people that I've met out on the road who have become part of my community and cheer me on and um, and encourage me and so as we've gone out and filmed it's just felt very natural honestly it's none of this stuff I I, I don't even get excited about it because it's like oh well, this is what's supposed to happen because this is a natural trajectory of it mm-hmm. And so I just kind of accept it as, well, this is just what it's supposed to be. And, uh, but I do know the little bits that I've seen of what we filmed so far has just been extraordinary. And when it's all put together, uh, it's going to just have a beautiful impact on people all around the country. And, uh, I, I kind of just I kind of just love the whole process of it. Um, I I make a point of you know wearing pink and stuff like it's like when I'm out on the road because my car is pink and the trailer's pink. People are drawn to that, mm-hmm. and I knew they would be. That was part of the reasoning for it. 
I knew that grief was very isolating. I didn't know anybody out there on the road. But if I do what I told Chuck that I was going to do and paint my car pink and now my trailer that I've bought, people will be drawn to me if only to say, oh, my God, look at all this pink. Mm -hmm. And I'll be able to tell my story and I'll be able to hear theirs. And that's what's happened. And so, you know, wearing all the pink that I do and seeing people's reaction to my trailer and then when they realize what all the names are about and then they message me, like if they've seen me on the road, they'll message me on my website or on my Happily Homeless page and they'll say that I saw you and then I read your story and thank you for doing this. And I've heard from uh, active duty um, military from a, a few years ago, I had a story done at McGuire Air Force Base and uh, and I had people reaching out to me saying, thank you for doing this for your veteran. And it kind of takes me aback because the way I look at it is I'm just somebody, I'm just an ordinary person. I'm just out there on the road doing this because I love my husband and he's dead. Mm-hmm. I don't know what else to do with my life that will bring me any kind of uh, satisfaction. So it's really, for it's awe inspiring to me to hear people's reactions to what I'm to, to my odyssey of love. And now that we're putting it on film uh, and, and I'm going to be showing it around the country and I'm going to send it to, I'm going to send it to, uh, to Ford and to Chevy because I want them to sponsor me and I want to do commercials. <laughs> I want to do commercials for them to encourage that will encourage people to get out there with all of their fears and all of their doubts and all of their anxieties and to just go freaking do it. Don't wait. Mm -hmm. Don't wait till you feel better. Don't wait till you heal. You don't have to wait for any of that. Just go and do that. Face your greatest fear and get out there on the road, whether it's in a, you know, with a trailer, an RV, you're going, you're just, you know, staying in your car, just get outside your comfort zone basically and go see what is out there in the world that can maybe spark some passion in you and and keep you going. And so I want to do commercials for them because I know I, apparently, I inspire a lot of people. <laughs> and there are more and more women buying cars and trailers and RVs and going out on the road by themselves. It's more and more, it's, it's becoming more than just a niche. It's becoming this really big thing. And, uh, and I know that because I started a group in face, on Facebook called Road Widows, Road Warriors, because I wanted to meet other widows who lived on the road. And we have almost 2,000 widows in that group alone. Wow. Yep. And they're buying their trailers for their first time or their RVs or they're dreaming about it. Or maybe they were already living on the road and their husbands died. And now they're, um, they're like I was afraid and anxious to go back out on their own. And we're cheering each other on. So, yeah. I I love this. I have to confess I have I have often heard stories of somebody going out and living on the road for a while and thought that sounds like so much fun, but I don't know what I'd be doing either. But I've never actually spoken to somebody who's done it, so this is kind of an extra <laughs> added bonus for me. So, I I I'm just I'm so struck by you know, you get an idea and you just do it. Do you ever hesitate? Do you ever question no 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 I just do it and if it's the wrong thing to do or it's a mistake or like it leads me down the wrong road I don't think that there's ever a wrong thing to do but if it just gets me somewhere where I don't want to be I just redirect or if I you know if it's like oh wow I really shouldn't have done that it's like eh, oh well I'll go you know I'll just go do something else now um it's kind of like when I was uh when I first set out and I didn't know how to back up, my biggest fear was, well, what if I head down a road and it's kind of like a dead end mm -hmm. or it's private or something and I have to turn around and I don't know how to. Sure. And there's not really enough space. What do I do? So I learned how to back up. I've actually done a K-turn with, with my trailer attached. Oh, wow. And <laughs> I don't know how. I may not be able to replicate it. <laughs> Um, but I did it. I've gotten out of some tight spots, um, you know, in, truly physically, literally. And so I kind of look at everything else. There is no wrong decision. I may do something and it's just not the right 
it just doesn't, I don't know, I end up not liking it even if, you know, as simple as that. And so I just go and do something else. I just redirect, well, okay, I'll go do this. And you know what? If it's something that where I ended up spending money that I really don't have, it's like, I'm not going to spend time worrying about it. You know, it's like, okay, that was then. And now here I am. My, I look down at my feet and I say, oh, here, this is where they are. They're not back there. They're here. And so now I'm going to head in that direction. And I just do it. I'm telling you, I don't overthink anything. I don't know that that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't put a judgment on it. Yeah. So somebody said to me the other day, judgment is optional. And I think that's beautiful. I want to, yeah. you know, put it on a bumper sticker. <laughs> it's very true. I also know that my way of doing all of this, my Odyssey of Love, would drive Chuck absolutely freaking bonkers because he was <laughs> in the military. He was a long range planner. And, oh boy. <laughs> and he was, he had, he was first shirt for a while, which means he was in charge of, you know, all of these, uh, different situations and he was a safety officer. So they always did the what if scenarios and I don't do any of that. Um, and I, like even when he and I were traveling together, he would plan at least two weeks into the future with making reservations and all this other stuff. And that's one of the things that was so, that caused me so much anxiety when I, uh, after he died and I thought, okay, I, I need to get out there on the road again. It's like my brain was in such a place. There's a thing, people who grieve, you know, they go th in the widowed community, we call it widow brain, but in grieving, there's the physical thing where you your your brain just is not um, working in the mm -hmm. same. Way. And uh, I thought I don't have it in me to look to two weeks into the future and make reservations and map out a route and arrive on time and all of this other. Everything is too uncertain. And I thought I can't do this the way that Chuck did it, and um, and that started causing me all kinds of upset. And then I, I stopped myself and I said, you know what, if you were talking to Chuck right now, telling him all of this stuff, what would he say to you? And I knew what he'd say to me. He would look at me and he'd say, beautiful, you know what, all you need to do is the way you do it. You don't need to do it the way I've done it. Do it your way. And once I realized that, it's like, oh, whew, okay, I can do it my way. I'm not going to plan one freaking thing. I'm just going to let my heart lead me. Because all I know is that he loved me. Nothing else is sure in life. Yeah. And I did it. And so, yeah, once again, here I am. And there there are two things in there that strike me as remarkable. The, the one is that, you know, how often does somebody say to us, do it your way? How often do we validate the idea that your way is just as good as somebody else's way? You know, it's like the whole plotter versus pantser thing. My way mm -hmm. is to write by the seat of my pants. That's where that term comes from. It's not to plot, but that doesn't mean that if you plot, you're a terrible person or vice versa. Right. And we get so hung up on the right way. And I mm -hmm. see this all the time because, you know, from time to time, I'll go on Quora and answer questions. And people are so hung up on things like, how many pages should a chapter be? I don't know. How many pages does your chapter need to be? I mean, it's it, every chapter is different. Yes. You know, and yeah. and it, 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 the whole idea that there is a right way just gets in the way, which actually is a great segue into the other thing that I was going to mention, which is, you know, you saying there is no wrong decision. You just you just redirect, which I'm sitting here and I'm sure that I'm not the only person who's going to listen to this and think, you make that sound so simple, but there are all of these things. And, and what about the money? And I bought the house and it's not that easy just to sell the house after you just bought it and you realize it's the wrong house or, you know, whatever. And, and, but you do, you make that sound so, so simple. And I think it probably is more simple than most of us remember most of the time. I, I would agree with that. I mean, humans are really good at making things really complicated. Yeah. I will grant you that there are some bigger decisions than others. And, uh, you know, I didn't have a house to return to, so I didn't have to sell it. Mm -hmm. and, and I thank God for that, um, that I didn't have to go through that. Um, on the other side of that is I had no house to return to, so I had to make a decision about how I was going to, you know. Right. Um, so... I've, I've ultimately simplified my life to such an extent that everything I own is in my trailer and in my car. Now, within that space, there's way too many boots, there's <laughs> way too many, like, 
costumes because you never know when you might have to wear a costume. So I carry costumes with me, which I consider ordinary clothes. I wear them out on the road. Um, I've simplified it to a, to a great extent, but one of the things that we're told in the in the grieving community, and I think it really affects people who are widowed, um, and by widowed I mean men and women both, that you're not supposed to make any big decisions in the first year. Well, that's so bogus because oftentimes it's the, in the first year that you have to make major decisions, mm -hmm. keeping the house or selling the house and cars and all of the big things. That we can get so bogged down in all of that. Now, maybe I have, as I've said, carried it to the other extreme. If I had a house and or if I bought a house and it was a wrong decision, honestly, the way I feel these days, I'd sell it at a loss and I'd just go because I've gotten to the point where if this doesn't work for me, I'm out of there. Mm -hmm. And I and I don't mean, um, you know, that I'm running from things at all. It's just that, like, if I'm in some situation or around people or, you know, I'd be terrible interviewing for a job anymore because it's like, oh, God, you know, really all of this stuff going on, the politics, I, I cannot do that. I'm not willing to do it. And I'm out of here. Um, I, I've really gotten to the point where uh, it truly is just. This is my life. I'm standing in my shoes. I'm not asking anybody's opinion about it. I've had people who have tried to fix me mm -hmm. because of leaving too long, um, who have offered their opinions, and I didn't even solicit their opinions. And yeah. <laughs> initially, it would be uh, I would react to it. And the way that I am now, it's like I just look at them and laugh, and I think, oh, you poor person that's still caught up in all of this thinking that you've absorbed, that you've been taught, all of this, um, we only have to, life is only as difficult as we make it. Circumstances can be difficult, but what we're putting into it, that doesn't have to be difficult. And so I just kind of, uh, I've really kind of streamlined everything in my life. And it really does, for me, come down to, am I in a place where there is love? If not, I'm leaving that place. Plain and simple. And I'm going to go find where there is some love. That's just like the, the clearest compass. Yeah. It sounds like to me. I mean, that that's, you know, it's, it's not all of the, what about the paycheck? What about the benefits? What about where, how long is my commute? What, what about where do the kids go to school? You know, all, all of that. Right. It's, it's so much simpler. And my ki my children were grown when Chuck died. They're in their you know in their late twenties, early thirties. Mm -hmm. So it it, it would be a different situation for somebody, a parent who's having to deal with young children. Uh, but we have like in the in the group I started, Road Widows, Road Warriors. There are many uh, widows who are maybe in their thirties and forties, still raising their children. And the whole point is, is that we have presented to them in that group. You know what? When the time comes when your children are raised, here's something that you can think about doing. You don't have to stay in that house and the picket fence and the cars and the job and all of that. And guess what? There's work camping and there's ways to earn a living out on the road. And you won't get rich, but you can make it happen. And you can make do. I'm not looking to be rich. Mm -hmm. When I decided to, that okay, the time has come to make a documentary, the other side of that was, okay, I need to be willing to... Um, I need to believe in this enough that I'm willing to spend every last penny that I have on making this documentary. And that's what I'm doing. And I am going to do some fundraising, but I'm not looking to get rich. I just mm -hmm. know I need to make a documentary. It's my legacy. And it's, and like I said, it's my love letter. It's, it's, um, it's the story, you know, I am just some regular old person who was loved more than probably so many other women are loved in this life by a really good man. And I've just decided to do something about that story and to carry through on my vow to Chuck that everybody that I ever meet for the rest of my life will know the name of Chuck D and who he was to me. And uh, so I'm, I'm willing to commit everything I have, time, money, and everything else to making this lovey-mentary about that. 
and what it's like being out on the road as a woman alone when you don't know what you're doing and you're really not much interested in fi- in learning. Like I'm not interested in learning about camping or how to make a fire. I don't care. I'm not interested in learning how to cook meals over a campfire. I'll flip open a, you know, a little thing of yogurt and I'll be perfectly happy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I have can relate to that. <laughs> I, I really don't care about any of those things. What I care about, and I don't care about going to places and visiting national parks and monuments and all that. I did all of that with Chuck. What I'm interested in now is sitting outside my trailer in my pink chairs and talking to people and hearing their stories and sharing mine. That's what I care about. Nothing else. That's beautiful. So see, you can see this back here. Mm-hmm. This is a life-size cardboard cut out of Chuck. Okay, yeah, it's a it's a cardboard. It looks like a cardboard cowboy, is what I was thinking. Yes, yeah, yes, and that's Chuck. And so the first time I saw it when I ordered it, it actually it, it gave me the chills because it embodies his spirit so much. So so he travel he'll travel around with me when I'm presenting my uh, love you mentry at different venues, and he'll always be there standing there like he was just slightly behind me because. He was always very happy to have me in the limelight, and he would be standing just behind me, supporting me, and saying, "You go for it. I'm going to be over here and be retired." And <laughs> <laughs> so that's what that is. <laughs> oh, that's great. I'm I'm wondering, and I feel like in many ways you've already kind of covered this, but if there's anything that you have learned or a piece of advice that you wish that everybody knew, or anything like that that you'd want to get out into the world on this podcast about being widowed or about being out on the road either or either or and both of them what i would say is it's never number one either or (laughs) life is completely gray all shades of gray for me all shades of pink and um you don't you don't have to listen to people who say, well, you know, you, you know, you can't just do that. You have to do this. It's like, you know, I can do both of those things. I can care and not care all at the same time. I can love and I can grieve all at the same time. I can feel passionate about my odyssey of love and hate the fact that I'm alive without him all at the same time. I think that it would help everybody, whether it's because we've uh, you've been widowed, whether you a special person in your life has died, whatever you're contemplating in life, going out on the road or anything, trust your heart instinct. You don't have to, you can get feedback from other people, but you're the one standing in your shoes. And the less you listen to other people's opinions of what you're doing, the better off you'll be. All you need to do is pack it all up. And whether it's figuratively or literally, you just pack it all up and you put it in a backpack and you just go. And you do it. You don't have to wait around for any of it. You take all of it with you. And everything in life is a duality. We live in duality. And it took me a long time to realize that in this grief. It's it's like, well, you know, you have to, you have to heal, right? And you have to choose to be happy and all this other hogwash that we're taught. No, you don't. <laughs> I'm not worried about being happy. What I, what I like to think is that someday I will find a sense of comfort and my heart will be a little bit eased. Happiness is a fleeting thing. I'm concerned more about making a difference in life and and looking for love, you know, like just f- or finding the love, not even looking for it, finding it and setting up scenarios where I know love will be and connecting with people. So we all just need to, We I, I think it would be so helpful if we would all just broaden our definitions of almost everything that we have learned and put away a lot of the stuff that we have learned and realize that we can create the lives that we want or the lives that we have to create, you know, if, if the circumstances have, have put that upon us as they have with me with Chuck's death. I'm not waiting around for anybody. People who, who want to look at me and judge and say, oh, it's over six years and you're still sad. Yeah, well, so, like, what's it to you? You know, you go live your life. I'll live my life. Yeah, I'm kind of in my world where nothing is okay. I'm surprisingly okay. You know, I I'm devastated, and I am living passionately all at the same time. It's possible. Yeah, 
that's that's a lot more than a lot of people who are devastated can say. I mean, that's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. We need to stop listening to everybody's opinions. Blah, 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 blah. You know, it's like the uh, the, the adult on Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> yeah, screw that. Yeah, the conventional but wisdom is often not very wise. It, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't. People, everybody will have an opinion. Just follow your heart. We don't we don't trust our hearts enough. We think it all has to be done. Yeah, in we don't. And figure it out and plan it, you know, and, and, and do all of the stuff on the wall. Some people that works for them, but if it doesn't work for you, then don't do it that way. Do yeah. it your way. Frank Sinatra, right? Yeah, exactly. Sinatra, he knew a long time ago. So he sure uh, did. So yes, yeah, so I'm take. I'm going to have my Odyssey. It's called an Odyssey of Love in Pink. Um, I'm hoping it'll be done maybe by late spring, and uh, I'll be taking it out on the road, and I will be. Uh, uh, meanwhile, people can follow my Odyssey of Love on my Happily Homeless Facebook page. And also I have a website called happilyhomelessismoonstruck.com. And the full story and pictures of my travels and things are there. Yeah, the pictures and, are amazing. And well, I'll put links to all of this in the show notes. And I'm oh, going okay. right. to grab some pictures from you to share, too. So, okay. but we'll Yeah, send just go on and grab whatever to... you want. Okay. <laughs> Honestly, it's all public anyways. Yeah. Fair Otherwise, enough. It's burnt, you know? True. <laughs> <laughs> True. But, so, but yeah, because everybody needs to see the trailer and your photos are amazing. Well, so, thank you. Yeah. But I, I, I feel like, I don't know, I feel, I feel like you have dropped a hell of a lot of wisdom in the last hour. You really Isn't have. That so funny because I feel like I don't know a freaking thing. <laughs> I could go on at great length about how much I feel like I don't know, which is almost anything. And yet I somehow, somehow I feel like, you know, a lot of us, something comes out when it needs to kind of, kind of like your whole trip. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. I, I, I just, all I'm doing is driving my car. The rest of it, it's love. It, it truly is. Yeah. Chuck left so much behind for me and it, um, it, it makes me get going every day. I can see that. It's amazing. And I'm so glad that you shared it all with us. This has been fantastic. Oh, thank, you. thank you. That's our show for this week. I'm so grateful to Allison for sharing her experience with us. I know she challenged a lot of my ideas about life, and I'll bet she's done the same for you. Let us know over at FY Curiosity on Instagram, or drop me a line at fycuriosity.com, where you'll also find links to Allison online. If you're feeling inspired to explore the idea of becoming your own guide and following your own intuition, I'm starting a book group for Martha Beck's Steering by Starlight on April 19th. For $25, you'll get 10 weeks to work through this book with a group of fellow travelers of all kinds. That link is also available in the show notes. I hope you'll join us. You can find show notes, the six creative beliefs that are screwing you up, and more at fycuriosity.com. I'd also love for you to join the conversation on Instagram. You'll find me at fycuriosity. Follow Your Curiosity is produced by me, Nancy Norbeck, with music by Joseph McDade. If you like Follow Your Curiosity, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to tell your friends. It really helps me reach new listeners. See you next time.